and welcome to chapter four of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. My name is Matthew Poole. I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State Community College, and today we're going over states of consciousness. So to give a definition to consciousness, it's quite simply an awareness of internal and external stimuli, such as feelings of hunger and pain or detection of light. So to put it quite simply, consciousness is an awareness of your surroundings. As well, wakefulness is considered high levels of sensory awareness, thought, as well as behavior. Now at the University of Leipzig, remember with Wilhelm Wundt, he started his first lab and the earliest idea of trying to study what we knew of, of psychology was trying to study consciousness. Okay, but that didn't exactly last too, too long because objective study of consciousness is very difficult to achieve. Now firstly we're going to begin by talking about biological rhythms. We all have a particular bio biological rhythm that we share and that's our circadian rhythm. This biological rhythm will last over the course of 24 hours so that's why we have a sleep wake cycle that is uh, generated by in our brain what's known as the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN. Another thing that helps us in controlling our biological rhythms is what's known as the hypothalamus. Remember in chapter 3 hypo equals homeo so hypothalamus makes sure that we are at homeostasis or at an even place making sure that we are uh, at an optimal level all right moving forward so to get into it a little bit more the suprachiasmatic nucleus an illustration is right here you can kind of see it uh, where the suprachiasmatic nucleus is very much near the hypothalamus. They need to be close together because they work together. Now, another you know, part of what assists us in uh, regulating our sleep-wake cycle is the pituitary gland. Okay? And one of the things that helps stimulate uh, our sleep-wake cycle is, of course, light. So uh, melatonin is something that is inhibited okay by light so it's really difficult for people to want to go to sleep or for that melatonin to build up whenever we are blast with um, with light so whenever you're going to sleep at night something that we and I'm uh, you know I do this all the time too I keep my phone on and I'm looking at my phone right before bed I, it's a bad habit but it's something that I'm trying to get better at because melatonin, that hormone that is associated with making us sleepy and is stimulated by darkness, it's having a difficult time with it whenever I put my phone up to my face. Um, almost every night, to be honest with you. And so people, whenever they associate, whenever they think of melatonin, they usually associate with the either the gummy or the pill that they can take that helps stimulate um, the production of melatonin. However, for myself, I can't take those melatonin supplements because they just make me super groggy the next day. Yes, I get a lot of hours of sleep, but it doesn't seem like it's quality sleep because I wake up even more groggy. Maybe it's because I'm taking too much melatonin. I'm not. That, when, whenever I have in the past, I didn't feel like I took a lot of it, but perhaps that's the reason why I experienced that. So it's uh, something to be mindful of if you decide take a supplement, uh, the supplement melatonin, because it can maybe do a little bit more harm than good whenever you take it in excess amounts. Also, my dreams are just super crazy, so I, I tend to just stay away from it, okay? Now, to give a definition to sleep regulation, this is our brain's control of switching between sleep and wakefulness, okay, those high levels of sensory awareness, as well as coordinating this with the outside world, okay? Moving forward, so a lot of us, if not most of us, have at least once in our life experienced a, a disruption of our normal sleep, such as jet lag. Okay, Jet lag is important to know, especially if you're in my class and you're taking it for a test. This is whenever our outside world does not match our internal circadian rhythm. All right, So this can lead us to feeling sluggish, sluggish. Uh, excess fatigue, irritability, as well as insomnia. So it takes us a little bit of time whenever, if I, you know, this is of course uh, recorded in the United States, so a lot of people who are watching this are probably in the United States, and they go over to Europe, you know, they're going to have a little bit of a, a difficulty adjusting automatically because of the time difference. So our outside 
environment does not match what's internal. Now another thing that can disrupt our sleep is rotating shift work. This is a work schedule that changes from early to late on a daily slash weekly basis. So we may uh, do a swing shift if for individuals who are on a swing shift. They could tell you that they experience burnout pretty frequently probably because it disrupts their sleep. So this would be like you have a shift from 7 to 3, then the next day you have it from like um, you know 8 to you know 5, uh, 8, 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., things like that. So it's constantly rotating and you never have, you can never really get a regulated um, routine going because even for individuals who are uh, nurses or who are in medicine constantly they have to do night shift work but usually they're just night shift versus just day shift from my understanding so they can at least get a routine and although it may be difficult initially to do night shift work it seems as though individuals get pretty adjusted to it okay all right, now let's talk about sleep deprivation. So don't go sleep on me. We're going to we're gonna uh, talk about sleep in the coming slides. So sleep debt is the result of insufficient sleep on a chronic basis. So if you're constantly getting not enough sleep, usually the recommended amount is, of course, eight hours. Uh, uh, some adults can get by on seven hours per night, but if you're chronically sleep deprived, like you're getting five to six hours, maybe that works for you, but studies show that uh, when you get to that, only that amount, it can result in a sleep debt. Now, as a result of sleep debt, you can have what's known as sleep rebound. So if you're a sleep deprived individual, you'll notice that it takes you a lot less time to fall asleep because you're just exhausted. Okay, I experienced this one time whenever I was in college and I was working like 30 hours a week at minimum and I was doing a full load of college classes, like five classes, waking up early, do, uh, doing my schoolwork, um, sitting through classes and then going to work in the evenings. I'd get home pretty late and there was just one time I didn't even make it to my bed. I just sat on the couch and within it felt like minutes I was fast asleep. So that was one of the times where I experienced sleep uh, rebound where I was so sleep deprived that it just took me absolutely no time at all to uh, go to bed. Now there's been a lot of you know TV shows and game shows where you know, they've kept people up for tw at least 24 hours and then put them through a series of cognitive tests as well as physical tests because uh, they know that whenever you're sleep deprived or we've you know restricted sleep from you, you're going to experience difficulties with uh, your ability to um, think properly all sorts of things related to cognition as well as with your physicality which includes decreased accuracy as well as um, uh, increased reaction time. So that's one of the things that can cause difficulty with um, with how you operate is not getting enough sleep. So go to sleep. Not right now of course. Keep watching this video. But afterwards take a nap. You deserve it. So what is sleep? So sleep is a state marked by relatively low physical activity and a reduced sense of awareness. So sleep-wake cycles seem to be controlled by multiple brain areas, including the thalamus as well as the hypothalamus. And we're going to go through um, a lot of, uh, or not a lot of, excuse me, we're going to go through the different sleep stages here in just a minute. But before we get to that, it's important to know that sleep, of course, is for adults is super important for our ability to function cognitively as well as physically. But teenagers, whenever they have summer break, you always wonder, like, why does Jimmy come back six inches taller after summer break? It's probably because he's sleeping a lot. And the growth hormone is stimulated by sleep. So whenever your friend comes back and you're like, what in the world did you eat uh, to be able to grow as much as you did? It's probably not just that. Of course, they're they're growing. They're, they're a teen, so they're going to grow more frequent. They're going to grow... Um, uh, faster, but it's probably because they're sleeping more and that growth hormone has more time to stimulate. All right, moving forward. So why do we sleep? Believe it or not, we don't exactly have like, a, you know, an exact way or reason why we particularly sleep, but there's a lot of ideas and hypotheses behind it. So there's an evolutionary hypothesis that's what's known as the adaptive function in that sleep is essential to restore what we expended throughout the day. So um, on top of this, it's not just replenishing those resources, but it's also an adaptive response to predatory risks, which increases in darkness. So if we just plant ourselves somewhere and we go to sleep, we find shelter, 
then uh, we reduce the risk of be, being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or whatever the case is. Uh, so that, But the thing is, is there's very little evidence to support this particular explanation for why we sleep. Now there's a cognitive function that we do have more evidence for in that whenever you sleep, you have adequate functioning cognitively as well as with your memory because we know with um, you know college students especially they think that staying up super late and, and cramming for an exam is an adequate way to retain information but it's really not I always encourage students to study before bed and go ahead and get your sleep for the night but and then try to wake up early to restudy for your exam because What's most important for memory retention uh, and going into exam is getting adequate sleep. All right, moving forward. So stages of sleep, there are five of them. Okay, we go through stage one through four, and then stage five is what's known as REM sleep, where a lot of that restoration happens as well as we experience dreams. So REM stands for rapid eye movement, and we'll dive into that more here in a few slides. Now stage one and two, this is considered our transitional phase between wakefulness and sleep. Studies will show that whenever individuals are woken up from stage one and two, that they feel like they weren't even in, they weren't asleep. So um, it's just a, a transitional phase. But the body through one and two goes through, uh, uh, goes into deep relaxation. The overall, our muscle tension and core body temperature decreases because when you sleep, you need your body temperature to lower a little bit for you to uh, enter into uh, rest, enter into rest and sleep. Okay. Now, in stage two, you have what's known as spin, uh, sleep spindles as well as K-complexes. So you'll see in figure 410 to my right, you'll see these uh, rapid bursts of high-frequency brain waves, and then these K-complex waves are very high amplitude um, patterns of brain activity. All right. Moving forward, we've got stage three and four sleep, known as slow wave sleep. This is where respiration and the heart rate slows down even further okay so we can experience dreams throughout any of these stages but um, REM sleep is where we really are have predominantly most of those dreams and we experience a sleep paralysis where we don't that's why we don't most of us don't interact with our dreams so if we're fighting off a, a, a demon or whatever the case is in our our dreams you know that's why you're not flailing around it's because you have a paralysis of your voluntary muscles now a story for me like whenever I was in high school and I found this to be funny is we've all probably experienced a hypnotic jerk at some point where we feel like we're falling and then we shock ourselves awake well that happens in one of these first uh, a few stages here and so for myself I was in high school, my senior year, I was the kicker for the football team, and it's a very, very repetitious thing. And for some reason, whenever I do repetitious things, I tend to dream about them. I don't know why I couldn't tell you, but it's just something that happens. And so uh, in my dream, I was in a game. It was the end of a, a football game, and I was up to kick to make the game-winning field goal. And as I was about to go kick, what happened was whenever I was swinging my leg through, I then suddenly woke up and the next thing I know, I see my leg flying into the air and it was that type of like hypnotic jerk uh, uh, situation. So I, I've experienced that in a, a multitude of different ways and uh, I thought that was so odd and never knew why it happened until I studied psychology. Okay, so now we've reached the holy grail of the sleep-wake cycle where we get that restoration that we truly need. Uh, we have that paralysis of our voluntary muscles, as I previously mentioned, so that's why we're not flailing around, screaming, talking. Uh, some people, of course, will talk and, and things like that and ex experience dream um, paralysis where they'll, um, you know, They'll, they may uh, holler and scream because they're having a nightmare, but we'll get to the disorders of, of sleep uh, here in a, in a few slides. Um, of course, the dreams, that's where they predominantly are, and this is where you want to get to whenever you uh, are asleep. And there are plenty of things that can disrupt your uh, time in REM sleep, such as drug abuse, alcohol, people think that you know whenever they consume alcohol of course they may you know go to sleep a lot quicker or sooner and get more hours of sleep but the quality of that sleep is not adequate uh, they spend less time in REM sleep so they're not really getting that uh, restoration that's necessary for their body as well as their mind 
Now, as we've kind of briefly mentioned in the past, we have tried to study dreams and look at the meaning of them, but unfortunately there's still no way in which we can adequately understand why we have the dreams that we do or what the meanings are of the dreams that we have. But that didn't stop people from trying like Sigmund Freud as well as Carl Jung. So Sigmund Freud thought that your dreams were like an access to your unconscious mind. And so again, he would try to analyze your dreams and bring what's unconscious to consciousness so you can at least start on alleviating the mental difficulties that you're experiencing. And he broke your dreams down into two categories, manifest content as well as latent content. Manifest content is the actual content of your dream and then latent content is the hidden meaning of the dream. So we all know that we have the actual content that we're experiencing, but Freud tried to look at the hidden meaning behind that dream. Carl Jung, he had an interesting take on dreams in that he thought that whenever we go to sleep and, and we're experiencing these dreams, we are tapping into some sort of collective unconscious that, you know, some it's, you know, a whole different realm, I guess you could say, that we all experience or that, you know, it's a repository of information that's shared by people across the world. And although that's a nice idea and hypothesis, there's no way to actually prove this. Uh, so, you know, that's... That's what, what we'll leave it at, is just a hypothesis. Now, something that's pretty neat, too, is what's known as lucid dreams. Have you experienced a lucid dream? I have. But the, diff the thing is, to give a definition to these lucid dreams, is this is whenever we uh, actually realize and understand that we are asleep. So I've experienced that where you know I've recognized that I'm dreaming and I know that, but I can't manipulate the content around me. Some people have the ability to lucid dream and actually manipulate what's going on in their dream. So if they're having, if they're you know uh, uh, have superpowers in their dream, then they can fly and experience the um, uh, concept of flying, or you know use the force for my Star Wars fan, be able to manipulate and move things without actually touching them. That would be really neat to do as well. So if you've done that, let me know in the comments and, and talk about your experience. I'd love to hear about it. Okay, moving forward with insomnia. So we're talking about some things that can disrupt sleep, but also that are considered disorders. So insomnia is defined by the difficulty of falling or staying asleep for at least three nights a week and for a minimum of one month. Okay, so you have to have experienced this for at least one month and for at least three nights of the week. This is the most common sleep disorder, and it may uh, be associated with symptoms of depression. Now, there is a ton of contributing factors. As mentioned, drug use can impact insomnia. Um, a lack of exercise uh, can impact insomnia. Your age, your mental status, as we've previously mentioned, some associated with symptoms of depression or anxiety, as well as bedtime routines. Bedtime routines are super underrated because whenever uh, sometimes we have to hack our brain in that we have to tell our brain when it's time and do things uh, to tell our brain that it's time to go to sleep or to do certain actions. So if you do a consistent routine, your brain is now switching into that mode of, okay, it's time to go to bed. So whatever your relaxation technique is, maybe yoga or uh, reading a book, definitely not using your phone because as we mentioned, that light can really disrupt and again, emphasize insomnia and make it worse. Okay, moving forward. So let's talk about some parasomnias. Parasomnias include un excuse me, unwanted motor behavior slash experiences through sl the sleep cycle. So commonly we all have at least heard of sleepwalking before, and this usually occurs during slow wave sleep. Again, this is not during REM sleep because uh, we have that and experience that paralysis of our voluntary muscles. We can't you know, move around, things like that. But some people will sleepwalk. Crazy thing to see if you've experienced it before. I know there's somebody that I've worked with before, and I won't give out names because I'm not going to call them out. I don't know how many people this will reach. They said that they have slept eight. So <laughs> you have eaten, you go to the kitchen, I guess, you're sleepwalking, but you actually eat a, a bunch of food. And uh, that kind of that stinks because you didn't even get to experience the pleasure of being consciousness and, uh, conscious and awake and enjoying the pleasure of said food. So you're just building up calories and things like that uh, without your knowledge. Um, they said that they woke up and they had like crumbs all over them and they knew exactly what happened. <laughs> all right, REM sleep behavior disorder. 
This is whenever the paralysis of your voluntary muscles uh, during REM sleep does not occur. So some people, if they have a, uh, this parasomnia, they don't experience a paralysis of their voluntary muscles. So they have all this physical activity while they're asleep. But thankfully, anti-anxiety medications such as uh, clonazepam, excuse me, can uh, assist with with this disorder. So there are ways to treat this. Restless leg syndrome, if you've experienced this before, it's super, super uncomfortable. It includes whenever you're lying down and trying to go to sleep, uncomfortable sensations in your legs whenever you're trying to fall asleep. And the only thing that can alleviate it is by moving your legs around. And obviously, if you're physically moving yourself, you're not relaxing and um, being able to fall asleep. This again can be treated by a variety of medications. Also, night terrors. So uh, some individuals will experience a sense of panic and may scream or attempt to escape whenever they're uh, asleep. This occurs during non-REM sleep again where there's not a paralysis of your voluntary muscles and, and uh, this is a very scary situation for individuals um, whenever they're experiencing these night terrors and it's recommended that you don't wake them up when they're going through it. You just have to uh, allow them to navigate it themselves. Um, Usually people will grow out of this and will occur in children, but it can happen to anybody. All right, moving forward. Sleep apnea. So this is a very common occurrence for individuals, and this is whenever individuals stop breathing during their sleep for usually about 10 to 20 seconds, or it can be even longer for some. So repeated disruptions in sleep lead to increased levels of fatigue, for obvious reasons, and that it is very common in individuals that are overweight. So there are two forms of sleep apnea. This is um, can be distinguished between two categories. Obstructive, this is when the airway becomes blocked and the air is prevented from entering the lungs, and then the central, which is when the central nervous system fails to initiate breathing. Your brain and spinal cord fail to initiate that uh, breath. So thankfully we have ways to navigate this through a CPAP machine. Difficulty with sleep uh, CPAP machines is that it's not very uh, friendly to the individual who, if you sleep uh, with somebody or near somebody, uh, it's very loud and can disrupt theirs. So, um, you know, that's that's one of the things an individual has to navigate whenever they get a CPAP machine. But for them, it works phenomenally. They they are able to uh, get, uh, you know not experience this, the stoppage of breathing. Okay, moving forward, SIDS. This is an, uh, unfortunately a very um, a very sad situation that some in infants will experience. Uh, horrific. I, I just, it, I, I can't give enough, you know, uh, sympathy to um, parents who have lost a child due to SIDS. Uh, there are a number of reasons why SIDS can occur, and but to, to go into it a little bit further, it happens more frequently in infants that are younger than 12 months. They're at the highest risk, um, and boys have a greater risk than girls. So there are a number of contributing factors, but namely the most common include a premature birth of the infant, smoking within the home so it's always encouraged to to not smoke around children in general but especially for infants if they're smoking within the home they are that much at risk for um, SIDS. Lastly is hyperthermia so this is whenever the baby overheats okay they're, they uh, they heat up too much and unfortunately that will lead to sudden infant death syndrome. Moving forward we've got narcolepsy another common uh, disorder of sleep that people will uh, have at least heard of. So to give a definition to it, this is whenever an individual experiences an ir irresistible urge to fall asleep during waking hours. And it is very much often triggered by states of heightened arousal. So whenever they're uh, uh, super um, in a super highly anxious situation or highly aroused with stress, that's when they may experience that narcoleptic episode. And what's you know, interesting but also heartbreaking about this particular uh, disorder is that individuals will experience symptoms that are associated with REM sleep. So it's like they'll go directly into REM sleep where they'll experience cataplexy as well as hypnagogic hallucinations. So uh, cataplexy includes the loss of voluntary uh, muscle control and things like that. So complete paralysis as well as with the hypnagogic hallucinations, they will experience those you know, what seems like dreams. 
And thankfully, we can treat narcolepsy. It's usually what's prescribed as a psychomotor stimulant drug. Okay, so narcolepsy can be treated. Alrighty, now we're going to move to talking about substance use disorders. Now, whenever it comes to substance use disorders, um, that's what the official diagnosis is given uh, to individuals. They're not called alcoholics or you know whatever insert um, insert name that you want to apply. They're is an official diagnosis for individuals as given to us by the DSM-5. The DSM-5 talks about all the different mental disorders that we have noted up until this point. So DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So let's talk about substance use as well as abuse really quick. So whenever it comes to addiction, we have two categories in which individuals can be uh, addicted to uh, particular substances. And a lot of times it's both physiological as well as psychological. When it comes to a physiological addiction, these people, their bodies are literally dependent on that drug in the sense that if they stop taking the substance, they will experience withdrawal symptoms. Some people will call it dope sick or whatever uh, phrase you want to call there, but literally individuals who have become physically dependent on a particular substance, they will experience negative consequences uh, and withdrawals whenever they stop taking the drug. So this is common for individuals, especially with these harder drugs. It happens, physiological dependence happens a lot quicker, especially with opioids. Okay. Now, psychological dependence includes the emotional need for the drug. So it's, if you stop taking the drug, you won't, you may not experience these withdrawal symptoms, but for some people, their mind has convinced them that they need to take the drug for whatever reason, because it's a, they do it, they've done so on a, on a pattern basis. They've done so consistently and a routine to, so where they uh, may have a glass of wine or a, a drink every evening, but that's it. But the thing is, is they have to have that drink. They've uh, convinced themselves that they need to take the drug every night or every other night, whatever the case or routine is. There's a pattern that's been established. Or some people think, you know, hey, it, it makes me perform better. It makes me, a, a, you know, a better learner or more attentive or more motivated. It's commonly, you know, seen with individuals who abuse stimulant drugs, such as your amphetamines like Adderall. And so another couple phrases that I want to go over with you all and, and make you aware of, because you probably be tested on this, is tolerance as well. And we kind of talked already about withdrawal, but tolerance is whenever an individual needs more of a substance to achieve the same result that they once did at lower doses. Okay, so whenever individuals first start taking a drug, they have no, you know, sort of tolerance to it, so they experience the full effect. But pretty quickly with most most drugs, individuals will gain a tolerance. And to me, tolerance equals dependence because if you're taking a drug uh, consistently enough to where you need more of it to achieve the same result that you did at lower doses, then you've established some sort of dependence. And as I've already mentioned, that's where withdrawal can come in, where you experience negative symptoms whenever you stop taking the drug. Usually when, in, when individuals stop taking their drug of choice, they'll experience the opposite effects of what that drug gave them. So if individuals uh, consistently consume alcohol, usually there's an alleviation of anxiety. And so whenever they stop, they may experience an increase of anxiety. So with whenever it comes to opioids, opioids, the function that they have on your brain is that they uh, have a pain relieving quality to them. And so whenever individuals are dependent on opioids and they stop taking them, they say that it's the worst pain they've ever experienced. Like their bones feel like they are crushing in on them. They're just so sick that it uh, makes them experience severe, severe pain when they're going through the withdrawal process. Okay, we're going to go through a different, uh, some different categories of drugs such as stimulants, depressants, as well as hallucinogens. Firstly, we're going to talk about depressants. Now, there's a common misconception when it comes to depressants. It's, it, the main function isn't that they inherently make you depressed. Yes, your problems are still going to be there 
after you stop taking the the drug or yeah after the drug wears off but it's not that it inherently makes you depressed when we say a drug is a depressant we mean that it depresses or suppresses your central nervous system so it has effectively like a quieting effect on your brain so that's why people may uh, abuse benzodiazepines like Xanax as well as alcohol okay so whenever people drink alcohol that's why you know, it allows them to escape at least momentarily. Uh, it suppresses your central nervous system, so anxiety uh, lowers. It has a quieting effect on the brain. Okay, stimulants, they increase overall levels of neural activity. So these are considered your uppers. They are dopamine agonists, and that's why these are so addictive is because they act on the very neurotransmitter that's in, that's. Um, involved in reward, craving, learning, and addiction. So it prevents the reabsorption of dopamine so there's more available within the synapse. So if you're, you know, preventing that particular neurotransmitter from uh, being reabsorbed, it's going to have a high potential for abuse. So some common uppers include, or stimulants, include cocaine, amphetamines, your bath salts, as well as MDMA. All right. And some side effects like for some individuals who uh, may take nicotine in excess or they don't have any sort of tolerance to nicotine, that's why if they take a good bit of it initially, they may uh, experience like a nicotine sickness such as nausea, elevated blood pressure, increase of anxiety as well as heart rate. Okay. However, nicotine as well as caffeine are legal drugs. We don't really uh, see that you know innocent cup of coffee as a drug a lot of the time, but it, I mean, it is. It's it is a drug. Um, nicotine is very highly addictive. It interacts with a, the acetylcholine receptors. I always struggle with that word, but you you get what I'm saying. And it plays a role in arousal and reward mechanism. So because it increases overall levels of neural activity, individuals may experience an increase in alertness, uh, heart rate, and things like that. Uh, so that's why it can be addicting, not just because of its dopaminergic effects, but because it increases alertness and um, it has studies do show that it uh, plays a role in memory too. So, but that's not a promo for nicotine because it's a very highly addictive substance, and there are other carcinogens involved in the way that nicotine is administered through cigarettes um, as well as vapes. The carcinogens in those are uh, very detrimental to your health long term. Okay, As well, cafe caffeine, of course, being a drug, it's considered a safe drug by most people, but still it has abuse potential as well as people bec uh, become dependent on it. So if you take caffeine on a consistent basis and then you stop taking it, you can experience withdrawal effects such as caffeine headaches um, and just overall levels of exhaustion. But whenever you take it in appropriate manners, you can experience those uh, pleasant um, side effects such as overall levels of alertness increase and arousal. It acts on your adrenal gland, so you have adrenaline, but its main function and how it operates, why so many, so many people keep going back to it and enjoy their cup of coffee or their energy drink is because it antagonizes adenosine activity. This is the main important takeaway from caffeine. We talked about antagonistic drugs in the last chapter where what they do is they block or impede neurotransmitter activity. So adenosine is that neurotransmitter matter that tells us that we're sleepy or tired and it builds up throughout the day and so when we first wake up we're pretty we can be groggy and that's where that cup of coffee comes in handy and if you're whenever you consume coffee it blocks it then it's seen from binding to its receptor so tr just trying to tell yourself that you're not as tired as you actually are and but the thing with caffeine is is that if you take it in too much amount you can experience um, anxiety and jitteriness. So for those who are sensitive or take too much of it, they may experience those um, those outcomes. Uh, and so some individuals, though, they may take a lot in the morning and people are like, well, why do I crash in the afternoon? Well, whenever you consume vast amounts of caffeine in the morning, the uh, caffeine will wear off and, and that adenosine that's built up 
throughout the day finally comes all at once and it, uh, you know that's why you may experience that crash is because that adenosine is finally binding to its applicable receptor so something to be mindful of opioids opioids are um, drugs as I've mentioned that decrease pain overall um, and so they're very highly addictive, especially physiologically speaking. It doesn't take a long time for people to become physiologically dependent on opioids. And so the main categories of opioids, they can be synthetic, which just means completely, um, you know, man-made, such as fentanyl or semi-synthetic or natural. So you've got a mix of them between heroin, morphine, methadone as well as codeine but what's interesting about methadone is that individuals will be given this in uh, a treatment setting to help with the withdrawal process but as we've seen uh, through recent history methadone is just as abused as the other opioids okay moving forward hallucinogens hallucinogens uh, cause changes in sensory as well as perceptual experiences. I'm going to be interested to see how the development of utilizing uh, hallucinogens in therapy continues to evolve because there are studies that show that it can be beneficial in small doses when supervised by a, um, you know, a clinician. And so some categories of hallucinogens include uh, mescaline, LSD, as well as PCP and ketamine. There are plenty of other uh, you know, hallucinogens under uh, this category, uh, such as marijuana, uh, most commonly used probably hallucinogen, as well as some others. Okay, moving forward. Let's talk about hypnosis really quick. This is one of the last things that we'll end on. Uh, I know it may seem like weird. Why in the world am I bringing up hypnosis when referring to psychology? But the reason I'm doing so is firstly because your textbook does so, but secondly because hypnotherapy is a thing. People do try to uh, do hypnotherapy on individuals. And it seems like hypnosis in in a use cases such as, you know, increasing awareness, increasing um, uh, extreme focus uh, does have some momentary you know, benefits to it. And it's been used in the past to draw out information uh, such as memories that may be buried in individuals. The thing with hypnosis is, though, from what I hear from hypnotherapists and individuals who uh, engage with hypnosis, is that, it again, it's not mind control. You know, you are always in control of the situation. It's just your willingness to be hypnotized. So if you uh, are more willing to be hypnotized or are a good um you know, candidate for hypnosis, maybe you can benefit from hypnotherapy. Something to look into, but I'm not going to, uh, you know, talk about hypnosis as a legitimate uh, way to alleviate mental difficulties in a classroom setting. But it is something to note, and it is something that intrigues me from a, um, you know, from a psychology point of view. All right. La uh, one of the, and I think this will be the last thing that we talk about, it will, is meditation. So meditation does have actual scientific studies to, to support its use. So meditation is employed whenever individuals focus on a single target, such as their breath or a repeated sound, to increase awareness of the moment. So uh, this can be really beneficial for people to just really focus in on the moment and to alleviate anxiety uh, is what it's been shown to uh, assist with as well as your sleep uh, and pain management so that does intrigue me uh, and whenever Clemson University their football team was going on a run there whenever Trevor Lawrence who's a, a very um, talented quarterback whenever he was on their team they were going on their championship run what they did each week was a weekly meditation uh, session and I thought that was awesome because you know those athletes are under an enormous amount of stress. I mean, they've got hundreds of thousands of eyes on them each week. They're going on a championship run, so the expectations are really high. And I think it's good to just take a moment to uh, focus in on the moment and uh, re try and relax. And it, it seems that, you know, over time that can do doing and meditation consistently can really help individuals with their anxiety and stress management. So something to consider uh, if you're and if you want to try and tackle your stress or anxiety or sleep from a holistic perspective, perhaps look into meditation a little bit.
All right, so that's going to complete chapter four. I will see you next time and in the next video for chapter five, sensation and perception. Have a great day.